so, yeah. It's a little darker than we usually have it, but I think it'll be fine. Is that okay? Are the lights okay? For, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. All right. All right. Oh, I have to give them a minute to get back to. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think we're going to get started. Welcome back, everyone, to session five, so our second to last session. Um, unfortunately, Allie couldn't be here today. Uh, she had a prior commitment, but she is planning on being here for the last session, which will be on funding and publication, so sort of more professional development around outcomes research. And we thought, you know, funding opportunities and sort of talking about writing grants and so forth might be of particular interest to this group, as well as some issues to consider around publication, where to publish, kind of responding to reviewers, those kinds of topics. But what we're going to cover today, one of my favorite topics, is um, statistical analyses and outcomes research. And our hope for today is not so much that you would be an expert in statistical analyses, because you know obviously that's not going to happen in um, you know a half an hour or 45 minute module, but that you would start to become more familiar with statistical methods used in outcomes research. And I'll walk you through a concrete example today. Um, and most importantly, that you'd understand, as we've been talking about throughout these sessions, about the sources of bias, methods to address biases. And again, not that you would be particular ex particularly expert in all of the methods used to address biases, but to have an understanding of it so that when you write your grant applications and you write your analytic approaches, that you could then bring that to your biostatistician or your methodologist to say, these are the things that, that I'm worried about. These are the things I think we need to be thinking about in terms of, of bias and so forth. To talk about creating some table shells um, related to first descriptive statistics, then some bivariable analyses and multivariable analyses. And I'll walk you through an example of that um, and why each, each is important in outcomes research. And then finally, to become aware of some other statistical considerations. So I'll talk specifically about missing data. And again, we could have spent six weeks talking about missing data. And missing data is a very, very thorny subject, controversial in epidemiology and biostatistics. Bio so we're not going to solve the problem of missing data, but we can at least talk about if you have a data set where you know a, a sufficient you know a, a substantial or concerning number of of patients are missing data which I will show you for this particular example that I'm I'm going to go through today there was a there were a fair number of babies who were missing data and so I'm not going to walk through all the analyses that we did to address that but I'll sort of talk more broadly about it and how how that affects presentation and so forth and then a bit about presentation and interpretation of data, um, which you probably, you know, if you're not going to be necessarily crunching the numbers and, you know, looking at the output, you certainly will be pulling together tables and thinking about how to present this to journals. So, for example, do you pre present an odds ratio or a relative risk? What's the difference? And when is it appropriate to present one versus the other? Do you present p-values or confidence intervals? And that will depend a bit on the journals that you're, you're um, submitting to. But they have different, um, slightly different interpretations. And, and there's a move toward, I will just sort of preview, there's a move toward relative risk and confidence intervals as opposed to presenting odds ratios and p-values. So you know, something to, to continue to consider when you're, when you're um, presenting your analyses at conferences and so forth. And then finally, we'll come back to to some of the issues for, that we talked about last week related to nationally representative data and survey weights. And we'll talk a little bit more about clustering and the, um, the importance of understanding and accounting for clustering in your data. But before I start, questions about what we're going to cover today or questions about last week in terms of uh, sur national survey data? Okay, so let's get started. So again, we always start with our roadmap here of where, where we've been and where we're going. So 
This week we're going to talk about data analysis. Uh, last week we talked about specifically secondary data sources and finished up study designs and kind of considerations for study designs. Now we're going to get into the more nitty gritty kind of number crunching or an overview of that. So we'll talk about descriptive statistics, which again seems very obvious and seems like something everybody would do, but it's, it's an often very much overlooked step that people tend to jump to the more complicated models and don't spend enough time just looking at their data and understanding what, what's in their data, what some of the frequencies are, and so forth. We'll talk about bivariate, bivariable analyses and the importance of looking at that prior to your model building. And then we'll talk about some model building um, related to building a multivariable model. And finally, we'll end with talking a little bit about sensitivity analysis and looking at some subgroup, subgroup analyses. All right. So in terms of thinking about univariable or bivariable statistics, really your univariable statistics are going to give you snapshots of prevalence rates or relevant sample sizes for your study group or your um, relevant subgroups. So this is a really important step, and oftentimes, I bring this up because oftentimes people will come and meet with us and want to answer a study question and want to immediately jump into how do I answer this study question, and they really haven't spent enough time actually looking at their data to understand what exactly is the prevalence of what they're, what they're looking to study. And if the prevalence is, you know, 0.2% in their population versus something that's 60%, you're going to use very different, very different statistics for that, and you're going to have obviously very diff different sample sizes. And if you're thinking about further looking at subgroups and you have a relatively small sample size where the prevalence is only 1%, that's really going to restrict your power for, for looking at comparisons and building multivariable models. So understanding first just what the prevalence is, the, the rates, the frequencies among subgroups, the means and standard deviations of continuous variables that you're interested in is really, really important because you want to understand not only the mean, but you want to understand the distribution of your data. Is your data very skewed in one direction or not? Or is the distribution around the mean fairly, fairly similar? Because again, that's going to guide what kind of analyses you use. So I can't, I can't emphasize enough Enough, the importance of looking at frequency distributions and so forth for your, for your primary variables of interest. It also allows you to know whether or not you have reliable information on some of the covariates that you might be concerned about related to confounders. So if you and your conceptual model have identified six or seven covariates that you think are really important confounders and only five of them are measured well in your data, that's a good point to say, oh, these other two, I'm really, con you know, I'm, this is something I'm really interested in, but I don't have very reliable data on it, or the distribution of this variable is much more skewed than I thought it was. So again, not a fatal flaw, but something that, you know, the data might need to be transformed, for example, to, to be able to be answered in a meaningful way. And then in terms, once you have a good sense of the frequencies, the distributions, and so forth of all of your, you know, your independent variables, your dependent, your outcome variables, any potential confounders, and so forth, the next critical step is to understand some of the primary comparisons that you want to conduct. So at, the, at first sweep, it's probably going to be a comparison, the association between your exposure and your outcome, just to get a baseline sense of what that association looks like before controlling for any potential confounders. And again, how the types of analyses you would use for that, depending on the type of variable it is, whether it's a count variable, a continuous variable, categorical, have multiple level variable, and so forth, that's all going to dictate the type of analyses that you would use. And then it, it also is a great step to then be able to compare to your multivariable models to understand well, what happened when I included all of these confounders. And we're going to walk through each of these, but just to kind of give you an overview of, of where we're headed. All right, so I'm going to give you an example. So this is some data that I analyzed. Um, it's related to heart rate variability in a preterm infant population. Um, so that it was looking at heart rate variability measured during feeding, during an oral feeding, measured at NICU discharge, and um, comparing that to later cognitive function at, tw at 24 months post-term in a sample of babies born preterm or less than 37 weeks in Wisconsin. 
So just by a little bit of background, if you're not familiar with this, um, preterm infants or those born less than 37 weeks often experience challenges with their autonomic regulation. So in, in a measure of that is, is a heart rate variability. It's become an important metric for autonomic regulation. And essentially, it uh, examines beat to beat variability in heart rate. So it's not, it's not the heart beat that you can see on a monitor or that you can detect by auscultation, but it's the beat to beat variability. So you need specialized software to, to examine that sort of intra beat variability. And it can be broken down with software into parasympathetic and sympathetic influences. And it essentially gives you a, a metric of how mature the baby's autonomic system is or their autonomic regulation. And just Again, by way of background, typically when you look at this ratio, you would expect it from baseline to an oral feeding that it would increase. So it's going to increase with the work of feeding, and then afterwards that it would come back down. So that's kind of the pattern that we would be looking for. However, um, it's possible that for babies that have that increased work of feeding but then remain elevated and can't have difficulty coming back down, that particular difficulty might be a predictor for later cognitive function difficulties. And I, I won't go into all the mechanisms about why that is, but I'm happy to talk with you afterwards um, if you're interested. So what we wanted to do was to examine changes in heart rate variability following the work of oral feeding in this low birth weight preterm population at hospital discharge to determine if difficulties post-feeding were predictive of later cognitive function at 24 months. So again, just this is what our uh, conceptual model was looking at. So our main exposure was the change in heart rate variability post-feeding. And our main out dependent variable outcome measure was cognitive function at 24 months post-term. So all of these measures that I'm going to show you are going to be adjusted for prematurity. So some possible confounders that we identified were things like neonatal morbidity. So depend, you know, how sick the baby is, how, what the NICU course was like is going to obviously affect their heart rate variability because it's a measure of autonomic function. But we also know that babies who are sicker in the NICU tend to have overall tend to have poorer cognitive function. Gender, socioeconomic status, and race ethnicity, we know we suspect that there might be some variability with physiologic markers. We know that there are huge disparities by race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status related to cognitive function. Um, and certainly growth throughout their NICU stay, their growth trajectory, their weight at discharge, and then the type of feeding might influence it, breastfeeding versus bottle feeding and so forth. So just as a highlight, I have pretty good measures on a lot of these, not all of them. The feeding type actually didn't end up being that important because unfortunately the NICUs um, were, did not have very high rates of breastfeeding. So there was only a handful of babies who were breastfed. So that essentially did not become an issue. But you can imagine that I would probably have decent measures on many of these, but not all of them. So we'll talk about that as being a limitation and how we overcame it. So our sample was babies born preterm or low birth weight. So they were hospitalized in one of three newborn intensive care units in southeastern Wisconsin between the years of 2002 and 2005. So we had a sample, an entire sample of just shy of 200 babies, mom, infant dyads. We had complete heart rate variability on 120 of them. And I will, pre I will preface that by saying that we actually, the heart rate variability data was not totally complete on the 120 babies. For about 15 of them, we didn't have very good measures of pre-feeding heart rate variability because they woke up. Because what you'd like for them is to be in a nice kind of deep, somewhat deep sleep, light sleep, wake for the feeding, and then, you know, kind of go back to sleep afterwards. So a lot of them got, you know, upset and hungry and started crying. So we didn't have great pre-feeding pre heart rate variability. And so those were the data that were missing. And so we had to do some um, methods to, to impute data that I'll talk more about. For these analyses, I'm just going to present the imputed data. So just to give you some background, so each infant went, uh, underwent about 50 or so, a little more than 50 minutes of um, continuous monitoring with a um, Holter a ambulatory ECG monitor. So they were measured 10 minutes prior to oral feeding, the duration of the oral feeding, which generally took about 20 or so minutes, and then 20 to 30 minutes post-feeding. 
And for each of those 10 minutes of um, heart rate variability data was analyzed and it was cleaned and all extra beat, ectopic beats and so forth were cleaned out of it. And the frequencies were decomposed into low frequency and high frequency bands to correspond to the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Uh, influences, and we're modeling the low frequency to high frequency ratio. So other covariates, family sociodemographics, so we had a measure of race and ethnicity, mom's race, race and ethnicity, family income, mom's education, the gender of the baby. We had a couple measures of neonatal morbidity, so how gestational age and how long the baby had been in the hospital. And cognitive function at 24 months was our outcome measure, and we used the Stanford Binet to measure that. So you'll see, based on this list, not all of the, the covariates in the box were there, right? So I didn't have weight at discharge. I didn't have any other measures of health or sort of growth, so other sort of physiologic measures. And the primary reason for this is that this was a study done by a developmental psychologist who had an interest less in sort of physical growth and development and more in parent-infant interaction and, and so forth. So these were variables that were just not, not collected. So our analytic approach, um, based on following the previous slide, we're going to look at some descriptive statistics. We'll conduct some bivariable analyses with our outcome and primary covariates. And then we'll talk about how, how we built the multivariable model. So because this is a continuous outcome, cognitive function is measured as a continuous outcome, we're using linear regression. And we're essentially going to model the change in heart rate variability between feeding and post-feeding as a predictor of cognitive function, controlling for the covariates that I mentioned. So the neonatal morbidity, family sociodemographic characteristics, and so forth. Yeah? You have a test where you can only have a result of, you know, 34 out of 50 or 35 out of 50 or 37. You can't have all of the values in between, right? So isn't that a discrete, you know, numeric outcome measure rather than like head circumference where you can have, you know, 34.1 centimeters, 0.2, whatever, or weight or whatever? So when I think of discrete outcomes, I think of more, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, are you suggesting that for cognitive outcomes you can get, let's say, you know, an 80, an 81, an 82, and it's, are you also suggesting it might be a net too narrow of a range to treat it as a continuous outcome? No, just that it doesn't, you can't get every measurement in between. Okay. Measures, so it's, yeah. I was under the impression that that meant that most people would still use linear regression, but that actually simply is not appropriate in those situations because the values were discrete within the range that you have established as opposed to some height or weight, which are clearly continuous. Um, yes, so I understand your question, but so I wouldn't call it a discrete. When I think of discrete outcomes, I think of more yes, no or categories where you're really forced to be into, you know, you're either you fell um, below the mean or above the mean, or you fell two standard deviations below the mean or between one and two and so forth. So to me, I would consider that a discrete outcome. Even though you can't score a 101.5 on the Stanford Binet, it's still a continual outcome in the sense that you can have a range of very, of values, and it doesn't matter that you can't get the sort of decimal point, you can get, you know, continuous, it, it's still considered a continuous measure. And so, but that's a good question because then, what, that's an empirical question because you can test it and you look at the distributions, and again, that's the importance of looking at your, your univariable statistics, your frequencies, because you can look and I'll show you that, so the mean of the Stanford Binet is 100, is 100 and it has a, sta a standard deviation of 15. So you can use that, and that's national data. So you can use your data to compare to that to say how, how well does my population, my sample, compare to what kids nationally do on the Stanford Binet. So you can look at both the mean. So do you expect that the mean is going to be the same in this sample? No, it's going to be probably lower, right, because it's a higher risk sample than nationally. The variability, what do you think? Do you think it's going to be the same as, the, as nationally or... It's what? 
broader, so there might, there's probably going to be more, more heterogeneity in this group for two reasons. One, it's a clinical sample, and secondly, it's a much smaller sample. You know, we're talking about 120 kids as opposed to being normed on thousands and thousands of kids where you get a nice, much more narrower, prettier bell-shaped curve. This is probably going to be a lot wider. That has a mean that's low. Um, but that's okay. Those are all still okay for linear regression. What we worry about for linear regression and just regular regression models that I'm going to present is that if the data were very skewed one way or the other. So if, it, if the mean was a lot lower and the variability was much different. So there was variability, the, the, the pattern of variability was different than what, what we would normally see in a linear regression, which assumes that you have a mean and a nice, decent bell curve distribution. So if you, if you stray away from that, then, then linear regression models aren't as appropriate. Okay, so if you have scaling at one, you know, if you have ceiling effects, for example, or basal effects, then linear regression models probably aren't going to be as appropriate because you're not going to get that nice, pretty bell curve. It's going to look more like a slope, or you might have two, two. It might be bimodal, for example, if you had two different groups, a high risk group and a low risk group. Again, for those considerations. Considerations, linear regression isn't going to be as appropriate. But that's a great question. However, just as a follow-up on that, so we could have modeled it. We didn't necessarily need to model it as a continuous variable. It might have been more clinically meaningful to have some kind of cutoff to say your two standard deviations below the mean or your one and a half standard deviations below the mean, you're either above that threshold or below. That might be of more interest to clinicians, for example. You could um, correlate it to eligibility for early intervention or something like that. So you don't have to necessarily model this as a continuous variable. We just chose to do it. Um, other questions? Okay. So before I go, so is it, how many people use SAS here? One person? Do people want to see the SAS code for this, or is that you don't want to see SAS code? All right, well, you'll have guys. If you want to see SAS code, this is what it looks like for the descriptive statistics. We'll skip over it. Um, but I do want to just point out, so we, this is where I, I um, created that change in heart rate variability variable, and it's essentially was the ratio that the low frequency to high frequency um, during the feeding minus after feeding. So that's where we're getting that difference model. But we'll skip over this. All right, so this is what our, our sample looked like. These are our descriptive statistics. So you can see, so this is helpful to look at. So the, at first glance, if we just kind of go down the list, you can see what do you notice about the sample in terms of diversity. <laughs> It's like Wisconsin, right? It's southeastern Wisconsin, so it does include it does include Milwaukee, so which is why we have the you know mostly so the non-white is going to be mostly black non-Hispanic women because it's Milwaukee, but we don't have a lot of racial and ethnic diversity in Wisconsin. And this, while it's not totally represent you know it doesn't totally match the census data, um, this is what we had, and so we collapsed the uh, everybody who was n not white non-Hispanic, we collapsed into this sort of minority category or non-white non-Hispanic just because of, you can see, only 24 moms. We're talking about 24 moms. Um, maternal education, so this gives you a sense of the distribution of maternal education. And we had it in, we, all, we had years of education, so we could have modeled this as a continuous variable. I'm an epidemiologist, and we tend to, whenever we can collapse variables into categorical ones, we always do. So I tend to collapse variables. Um, and so that's why we broke it into high school degree or the equivalent, some college, and so forth. So you can kind of see the distribution there. Again, pretty, um, you know, doesn't n totally match the Wisconsin population. Generally, this, po this sample tended to be fairly affluent, fairly well-educated, and white. So again, that speaks to the generalizability of these results. Um, household income, again, we had it as a continuous variable, and I collapsed it into these four categories. Multiple births, about one in five of the babies were, um, or mo you know, moms had a multiple birth. And this probably is, for those of you who work in the NICU, this supplemental oxygen discharge, this number is probably like extremely low here, right? Because you guys send all your babies home on, on oxygen. Um, but this is, you know, outside of the, you know, living at 5,000 or whatever, 6,000 feet, this is pretty typical. 
rate of chronic lung disease for the rest of the world, the sea level world. Um, and then about half the, half the sample was female. So, you know, it gives you a sense of, you know, subsample, you know, your potent, your, your, the potential for you to do subsample analyses. You know, if you were really interested in race and ethnicity, you're not going to be able to delve too far into this, right, because you have very small sample sizes. You can still answer your primary questions, but, you know, if a secondary aim was to think about socioeconomic status, you might be a, a bit limited. You could kind of explore income and education a bit, but again, this, date, this sample is fairly, Fairly, has a fairly high SES and is fairly, um, you know, not, not, it is not racially diverse. And then in terms of looking at the means and standard deviations of your, of your other variables, this is just gives you a sense of the heart rate variability, what it looked like at each time point. And for those of you who are familiar with heart rate variability or measure it on older kids, these numbers are going to seem low to you because it's preemies and it will increase with, with um, age, with chronological age. But this gives you a sense of the mean and the standard deviation and the range. Okay, so this helps you know, you know, ballpark about the sort of distribution of your data and you want to make sure that the standard deviation are, you want to kind of scan them to see are they fairly uniform across all of your variables or is there one variable that has much wider or much smaller standard deviation than another? And thinking about the range, do you have outliers? Are there kids in, are these real outliers or are they, ones that you, you know, see so then you have to decide is this something you want to keep into you, in your sample or pull out and analyze separately, for example. Um, and thinking about, so doing this exercise can be really helpful when you get your results because one of the things, one of the sensitivity analyses that is very helpful to do is to pull out some of the outliers and see if you still get the same results. And if you get the same results, then that's a test of robustness, that it's not just these few kids that are doing poorly or doing incredibly well that are, that are driving your results. Um, and with some of these models, that, that they can be very sensitive to outliers. So understanding that and kind of going through that exercise is really helpful. Uh, birth weight, you're probably not surprised, about 700 and 1781 grams with a standard deviation of 579. You can see the range 564 to 3328. And this is uh, days in the NICU, so about on average, the kid spent about a month there and it ranged from two all the way up to 136 days, which is pretty typical because our I think, oh, so I didn't go over gestational age, sorry. So um, average mean was 32 weeks, and it ranged from 24 weeks to 37. So, you know, not surprising that some of the 24 weekers spent 100 plus days in the NICU. So questions about this? About your descriptive? Pretty straightforward, but again, a really, really important step to do. Um, okay, we'll skip over the SAS code for the bivariable analyses. So then the bivariable analyses are going to look at your main outcome measure, which again were cognitive function at 24 months, modeled as a continuous variable using linear regression. So these are unadjusted linear regression models where each variable, so for example, for example change in heart rate variability is, is modeled, is used as a predictor for a cognitive function and nothing else is included in the model. So these are unadjusted values. So what this tells you is, and so the column, I, I'm calling this mean difference here, because that is the mean difference in cognitive function for a unit change in any of these variables that are listed here. So a unit change in heart rate variability is associated with a 16 point higher cognitive function at 24 months. So we have to remember too, a unit change here is the change from feeding to post-feeding, right? So we're expecting that, we're expecting the feeding number to be higher than, the not, than post, right? Because that's what we want to happen. We want that to be high and then for the infants to come to, down. So for infants for whom that's positive, then that's associated with more optimal cognitive function, which is what we would expect. There are many infants for whom that was negative or zero, and that was associated with adverse co or lower cognitive function scores. And I just chose to present the mean difference in the p-value here. A better approach would have been to also pre to present the confidence intervals around that. And in the paper, we actually do present the confidence intervals. Um, and you can see for the other variables, so for family income, probably not surprising, these are unadjusted. So this is just the association between family income and later cognitive function. So for kids in the lowest income bracket, less than $10,000 per year, that was associated with 13-point lower 
cognitive function at 24 months. And just to sort of ground this for you, the standard deviation is 15. So these kids are showing, so one unit change in heart rate variability is associated with a, one, a difference of one standard deviation on the Stanford Binet. Family income, again, you can see not, not quite a sort of trend response, but um, they're all hovering around you know, 11, 12, 13% relative to this reference group of the highest income bracket. Mom's race and ethnicity, probably not surprising. This is consistent with the literature that minority children have you know, at least half a standard deviation lower cognitive function at 24 months than their white non-Hispanic peers and, and so forth. You can kind of go through um, the, the rest of them in terms of mom's education. And just a note about um, how we categorize variables. I chose to leave days hospitalized and gestational age as continuous variables. And just because it wasn't my primary area of interest, I had no sub-aim related to gestational age or how long babies had been in the hospital. I essentially just wanted to control for that covariate. But you can see, and this is why epidemiologists tend to categorize everything, this is not particularly helpful, right? Because we're talking about, for days hospitalized, we're talking about you know, the unit change is so small that it's probably not meaningful. So there's a couple things you could do. You could bracket this into something that's bigger. So you could do a 10-day ten, ten change, right? So then you'd just be moving the decimal point over one. Um, you could categorize it into more clinically meaningful values. And then you might get more information, and some of those groups actually might be statistically significant. Um, and I bring that up, you know, especially with gestational age, maybe not days hospitalized, but gestational age, when you think about, you know, a week, you know, the small increment, the unit change, it might, it might not have a lot of clinical relevance, but if you think about, you know, early preterms, preterms, and late preterms, that might be, well, it is a lot more clinically meaningful. And I presented this poster at PAS last week or two weeks ago, whenever PAS was, and, and people really were interested in that group, you know, for, for me to go back to the analyses and kind of look at some, you know, subgroup analyses of the late pretermers versus the early pretermers and so forth. So just to say that this, that would be very easy to do. And, you know, again, if you had looked at your data in the beginning, you would know sort of what the distributions were, what the mean was, and would you be able to conduct some meaningful analyses or, you know, you have this sample or, you know, all of them late pretermers and you are only going to have a handful of the early pretermers. Yeah, Mary Jane. But given your sample size, then how do you decide if you have enough early preterm, middle, you know, mid preterm and late preterm to actually better understand that variable? Yeah, that's a great question. So she asked, I'm going to repeat it for this. So she asked about how would you know if you have a enough sample size? So that's a really great question. And so nobody, nobody has the perfect answer to that. So I will tell you, so where I trained, so I trained at Harvard. And so they said um, some, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 is, a, you know, is a, a decent subsample. Wisconsin said, the folks there, the biostatistician said around 10. Anything less than 10 would not be reliable. Again, it's going to depend on what type of what type of um, method you're using. Linear regression, you probably can be a little bit more sensitive to the smaller cell sizes. If you're using a logistic regression, you you want at least 10. You want at least 10. Um, so if you had if you had less, I would not feel comfortable with less than 10. Um, but again, there's no. So there's no sort of hard and fast rule about that. This has just my, been my training and experience. I don't know, have other people heard other cutoffs? No? You know, the more complicated your models get, the more you're, the more you're going to. So if you're doing models where you're, you know, looking at different levels and so forth, you're going to need more. Um, but for a simple linear regression like this, probably 10 is, is, is sufficient. Okay, so then how do you move from here? So this picture, just, you know, probably nothing was sitting on this. Um, you know, the good news is that, you know, at least for, you know, you're thinking about your study and that you're finding some potentially interesting results. Um, but then how do you build your multivariable model? You can't just present this, right, and say, well, it's the change in heart rate because we know that there's a whole host of other things that also affect cognitive function. Um, so then how do you build that multivariable model? 
And there, there's a number of approaches that you can use to build it. So these are the covariates that we're working with. And again, not our complete list. If we had our wish list, we'd have a couple more on here. But we're, we will work with what we have. Um, so let's talk about how we move now from here to a full model that controls. So it would still examine change in heart rate variability, but would control for all the important confounders or potentially important confounders. So the first step is to examine the bivariable association. So by looking at this, what are those that you think are halves for your multivariable model? Income and family education. Income and family education. How come? Not the highest mean difference. The highest mean difference. OK. Most OK. I like that you said highest mean difference before p-value. But yes, they're both important. But yes, often people, oftentimes what people will do is just look at the p-value. And that's helpful. But if you have a, so for example, there, you might have a variable that has a very high p-value, but the effect size is very, very small. So then you have to decide, is that really an important confounder? Is it, you know, is it a sample size issue? So that was great. Effect sizes are pretty close to your heart rate variability yeah. effect size. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they're close to the heart rate variability effect size. And then in terms of the true definition of effect size and sort of clinical meaningfulness, it's you know, it's, it's a pretty decent effect size because it's almost a full standard deviation on the exam or the evaluation. Okay, so income, education, anything else? We could include ethnicity and gender, mm -hmm. um, but, but those would likely be less, um, less significant. Yep. Maybe going along with that. Mm -hmm. So you could include eth mom's race, ethnicity, and the gender of the baby. All right. Anybody advocating for including these? I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense looking at the numbers, but I can't imagine a study without those. I right. mean, I wouldn't want to personalize this whole important. Exactly. So just it, those. yes. So you are like a typical reviewer, right? <laughs> so if you presented this and only included, unless maybe if you were sending it to a really social, you know, a journal that was just focused on sort of social issues, but even then, I think you would still. But certainly, any medical. journal journals, you are very in very good company to say you need to control for neonatal morbidity. It needs to be in the model. So there's a couple schools of thought. You guys have brought up a lot of really important points. So the first being examining the bivariable association. So not just the p-values, although that's a good place to start, but the effect side or the you know effect estimate as well. And if so then you can go through a process like we just did of, of saying, well, you know, I these are important seem to be important variables. They have very large effect estimates. I'm going to include those. But you know what? These ones are not significant. But my theoretical model tells me that these are really important variables. And reviewers and everybody else is going to want to see them in the model. And so that, you, that could be sort of your process of kind of thinking about how you build your model. And that is completely appropriate. That is a very, very appropriate, physically grounded, empirically grounded way to build your multivariable model. If you feel, oh, yes. So, so treating it as um, an ordinal variable or groups. So there's a couple different ways you could do it. So you know your range is between 24 weeks and 37 weeks. So you could treat it as a continuous variable. You could group them together in sort of two-week intervals. You could treat it as an ordinal variable. You could um, do what would probably be the most clinically meaningful, which would be the you know, 24 to 32 weekers, 32 to 35 or 6, depending on whose definition of late preterm you look at, and then 35 to 37. So absolutely, this early on, I could have, we could have done that. The only reason I didn't, like I said, it wasn't a particular, you know, interest of mine at the time. It wasn't a sub-aim, so I just, I wanted to control for neonatal morbidity for the reasons that you brought up, that reviewers would want to see it in the model. and. It just seemed, you know, that it needed to be an important part, and I didn't necessarily, I wasn't that concerned about the effect estimate, but if I were and wanted to think more about late pretermers versus early, and I think that's where we're going to go next with it. So, yeah. I think your, overall, your model, your measure of morbidity is not as ideal as you would like it, right? Yes. It doesn't just have discharge, doesn't it, have discharge mean, it doesn't have other measures. Yeah. So, using terms or using gestational 
middle age and um, uh, birth weight is probably the best way to look for, you know, like a, a proxy aim or a proxy measure of neonatal morbidity is, you know, kind of combining those two things here because you know that the smaller, younger babies are going to do worse from a developmental perspective, yep. irrespective of their heart rate. Yeah. So she's suggesting combining birth weight and gestational age and putting them in the model together. Is that what you're saying? Which is a great strategy. What do you think the problem with that? What do you know about birth weight and gestational they age? They they're almost, they're, the correlation, I think the correlation is like 0.7 or something like that, which is why for many of these models, we picked one versus the other. And, and if this, the field is moving towards preferring gestational age, which is why I included gestational age in there for the reasons that you brought up, that birth weight, you know, it's a, it's, it is a good proxy, but maybe not as good of a measure or an indicator, I should say, of um, neurodevelopment as gestational age. But, you know, that's not, that could, reasonable people could disagree with that. But that's the reason we didn't include both of them. We included one or the other. But to your other point about this is not a very comprehensive measure of um, neonatal morbidity, in another set of analyses that we did to much larger sample, a regional cohort of ba very low birth weight babies, we had SNAP scores, which is, for those of you who are familiar with SNAP scores, I mean, it's, you know, six measures of, you know, a lot of physiologic measures on the kids, and it's a much more robust measure of neonatal morbi morbidity. Um, and in most of the models, that was statistically significant in the other, in the other data set. Um, okay, so if you, um, if you didn't feel comfortable, if you didn't feel like you, if you wanted a more empirical way to build your multivariable model, there are a number of procedures, what we call um, stepwise procedures that you can use. And these are very easy to implement in statistical programs like SAS. And there are two main ones, a backward and a forward. And essentially, the backward one, you start with your full model. And essentially, what we did with the looking at the table and you kind of scan the, the p-values and it basically is going to eliminate the highest p-value first. Refit the model and look at it and so forth and keep, keep eliminating until you get, um, you know, a well-fitting model that has important, what it considers important covariates. However, what do you think might be a problem with that type of approach? So if we did it, this is, what do you think, what do you think it would look like? It's going to fit a model with family income, mom's education, may one other covariate, right? So it's not, it's empirically driven, but not theoretically driven, right? So it needs somebody to go back and say, it bumped out gestational age, or it bumped out this other important covariate, because it's only based on p-values. It's totally empirical. It's not theoretically driven, um, which is the criticism of these, sorry, these types of um, proce um, procedures. They're often used in health services and outcomes research, but I'm, I'm encouraging you to use them with caution. The, the um, alternate stepwise procedure is a forward model where you start with a null model, so no covariates, and it gradually adds them one by one until it looks at model fit, okay? So it could be that when you, you might get very different results. You might get a different model when you do the forward because it'll start adding in one at a time. And it could be that it starts with income and education, but then, you know, it, 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 when it adds in mom's race and ethnicity, for example, it, that does improve the model fit. So you can get um, variables that are not just related to p-values, which can be a little more theoretically sound. But again, very empirically driven. What we call the kitchen sink model is you just throw everything in there because you're, you know, you collected it, you think it's important, you're just going to throw, throw it in there. Um, so a, 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 a strength of that is that you're probably going to include most of your confounders. A problem is related to the birth weight gestational age example is that you're, you might have a lot of variables that are collinear. And so the way you would uh, look at collinearity is including models in, including variables together, and essentially when you see the standard error explode, that's an a indication that you have some collinearity in your variables. And so that one way to think about that ahead of time is, start, is to do cross tabs of some of your variables or a correlation matrix to look at, well, how are my variables correlated with each other? And you might not want to include two variables that are highly correlated with each other, like birth weight and gestational age. Or you could use 
some kind of combination. You might start off with a stepwise procedure, but then say, I really think gestational age should be the, in there and so forth. The bottom line is it should be both thickly and empirically driven. So again, the importance, I know we keep saying this over and over again, of having that really sound conceptual model, because without that, things you can see where things would fall apart and important variables might be left out of, out of the, the final multivariable model. So we'll skip over what it looks like. So here are the, this is the, the multivariable model. These are the covariates we decided to include. And you can see, maybe if you remember, or have it on the slides, I guess, that the change in heart rate variability didn't change a whole lot, right? So it was pretty robust to these potential confounders. Um, so 16.53, what was it back here? 16.39, okay? So not a lot of confounding by these, by these other variables. You know, family income is still significant, although the effect estimates have, um, have uh, attenuated a bit, which is not surprising when you include education and race and so forth. Race um, can, it is, so in here, um, race is statistic, borderline statistically significant. So the way you can judge this, so these are, these are mean differences, again, and these are your standard deviations. So if you just, to figure out, a, I didn't include the p-values here, but to, to figure out if a p-value, if this is statistically significant, you essentially just um, double the, the standard error. And if, it's the, if you double the standard error and it fall, it's close to your effect estimate, then it's probably not, or greater than your effect estimate, it's not statistically significant as sort of a rule of thumb. Um, days hospitalized, and so here you can see gestational age, the effect estimate is bigger now. And again, that's probably not surprising given that there's some confounding going on and um, related to the other covariates of interest. Questions about that, about the final model or the results? Okay, so in the last couple minutes here, we'll just kind of go over some other considerations. So I mentioned this earlier about presenting this. So p-values versus constant intervals. So here, um, you know, if you're going to present um, betas or effect estimates and standard errors, um, you generally people will also prevent, present p-values. But I will say that the field, even the medical literature, is moving much more towards including confidence intervals. So pediatrics, archives of pediatrics and adolescent medicine really is, come, is does not want to see p-values at all. They want to see confidence intervals. Um, so just something to consider. And it's very easy. I know you probably don't want to see SAS code, but this is all it takes, this little code right here, to get your confidence intervals around your effect estimate. So it's, it's very easy to do in, in um, software. Or if you're, you're using a software that's not easy to do, it's actually relatively easy to do in Excel. And I'm happy to share you know, that with you afterwards. Or you can email me. Um, and then in the case of binary outcomes, so yes or no, or if we had done a cutoff for this, um, for cognitive function, you know, one and a half standard deviations below the mean or above that, do you, you know, if you do an ordinary logistic regression, it's going to pop out, spit out um, odds ratios for you because that's in a logistic regression model, that's the, the metric. The problem with an odds ratio is we, we want to use, we want to talk about relative risk. So if you're white non you know, minority versus white non-Hispanic, what is your, the, you know, what are, what's the relative risk that you're going to have poorer cognitive function than your counterparts if you're in the lowest income bracket compared to the highest, for example. And the problem is the odds ratio only approximates the relative risk um, for very rare occasions. So when you get to things that are much more prevalent, then the odds ratio overinflates your relative risk. So the field is really moving away from presenting odds ratios. And again, not something you have to know how to do or how to convert, but to be aware of it when you're writing grant proposals, when you're presenting results at conferences, submitting papers and for publication and so forth, that the field is really moving towards relative risks and um, confidence intervals as opposed to p-values and odds ratios. Um, and then it's always important, I mentioned this earlier, to do some sensitivity analysis. So to pull out your outliers, either you know the ones that are very low and see if your your is the same. Are they robust to pulling out those outliers? That can speaks a lot to to your methodologic um, plan. Um, you could also look by gestational age subgroup, which we've talked about. Sensitivity analyses can also be really helpful to think about unmeasured confounders. So in here, one of the 
things that we didn't have a good measure on was um, health outcomes of the kids. So it could be that these kids went on to develop asthma or develop some other chronic condition, and that's really what's going on with their cognitive function. And it really, you know, so that could be confounding it, right? So these are sick babies. They had poor autonomic regulation. They developed asthma or some other chronic condition, and that led to poor cognitive function. We didn't have a measure of that. However, so there's a couple things that we could do. So we did have a measure on the kids with and without chronic lung disease. So that could be one approach. The other would be you could test some of your assumptions. So you could go into the literature and say, well, what percentage of, these, of this sample would likely develop asthma? You know, is it 1%, 5%, 10%? And what do we know about the relationship between asthma and poor cognitive function? You know, it's a five-fold increased risk this fold increased risk and you can you can add numbers to your model and modify your model and retest your model with those assumptions and see if the results change if the results change a lot then you potentially have a lot of unmeasured confounding by asthma or child health if the model changes very little then that's justification to you that it probably wasn't it may be a little you know it might be a confounder but it wasn't isn't a very important confounder because it's not changing your model. So I'm going to talk just very briefly about the first one. So sorry, this is very wordy, but so this is a reviewer sent me. One difficult, these are not related, they're similar analyses not directly related to this paper. It was a paper where we were looking at cognitive function and mom's maternal depression trajectories and so forth, but the, the issue still stands. So the review said one difficulty with the study is that the authors did not have a measure of child current health that could impact both the child's cognitive function and maternal depressive symptoms, but can also replace heart rate variability and cognitive function. And so I replied, you raise a very important issue. Our analyses were not able to account for current health status, which may confound the results we have we obtained. So the difference in cognitive function variability in children's health rather than de maternal depression can kind of replace heart rate variability. And I said we had no means to measure the, you know, to determine the extent which this might have biased our results. However, we conducted some sensitivity analysis. And basically, we investigated key descriptive st statistics for children with and without chronic lung disease because our thing was that that's a big precursor for asthma, right? So, you know, one of the most prevalent chronic conditions in this population is going to be asthma. So, you know, if we're talking about ch current health status, for sure it could have included a number of other conditions, but by and large, it's really going to be asthma. So, what we did was we reran the Including the children lung disease. And our thought was if the cryptic statistics differed between the chronic lung disease subgroup and the non chronic lung disease subgroup, that we worry that it might have biased our results. And so, what we found, and I'll show you the table, when we excluded the children with chronic lung disease, the results of these are different models were nearly identical. Therefore, we cannot rule out the possibility of bias by omitted child health variables, but we are confident that minimal bias was introduced by not having a measure of child's current health status. So again, we can't say for sure, right, that there's no, this didn't found the results at all. At least we're making, you know, we, we have some justification, we have some ground to stand on when we respond to reviewers and read and accepted the paper is good. Um, so, you know, essentially what we did was, and again, these are, it was a slightly different paper looking at social support and mom's clinical depressive symptoms, but again, cognitive function just at a different time point. And you can see that there's not a big difference in the kids with and without chronic lung disease. Now, granted, this chronic lung disease sample was very small. It was only 11, 11 kids, but still, if we got wildly different results in cognitive function and all our other measures, we might say, ooh, you know, you're right. We really need to be worried about this. Um, okay, so missing data. So as I mentioned before, 20 cases were actually missing the pre-feeding heart rate variability data. And so essentially, we used a multiple imputation method where we looked at the covariates for the kids who had complete data, and we did a predictive model where we could come up with the pre, what we think model-based estimates for the pre-feeding heart rate variability, and essentially pooled all of that together to come up with the results that I presented to you. Um, so there are ways to get around. We didn't have to drop the cases because, you know, the concern with dropping the cases is, is there something different about those kids? I mean, probably not. They were just, they woke up hungry, but you never know. So, yes. So what we so what we did was we used a method. So we had 
we used the kids that had complete data. So we had complete data on pre-feeding, feeding, and we also had a whole host of covariates on those kids. So we had a good picture of what those kids would look like, and then we compared our subsample that was just missing pre-feeding data and kind of compared all the covariates, and based on sort of a pattern of responses for the covariates, we predicted what that pre-feeding heart rate variability would be. Oh, no, no, no. So the multivariable, that final multivariable model, that's not what we used. We used the, the response profiles of our complete data source. So we used our entire sample to predict, because that's all you really have, right? And your alternative is to c delete the cases, which could be problematic as well. So one strategy would be to do your multiple imputation, do it one way, delete the cases, look at those results, and compare them. And they should be pretty much the same. And, and they were, yeah, yeah. Because it seems to me that that's just kind of assuming that those kids are oh. the same as everyone else. Exactly. And they may not have yep. been. They, um, so if you do a few analyses to compare them and make sure that they uh, aren't skewing the data, then I think it's reasonable. Yep. Right. You're absolutely right. So when you when you multiply impute data, you're making a lot of assumptions. And I won't go through all of them here. And it's there these are assumptions that are very, very easy to violate. Um, so it's pretty strict assumptions that things are sort of missing at random and, and so forth. Um, and then so the last thing, I know we're over time, but the last thing I just wanted to mention, um, because we didn't go into a lot of detail about it last week, was clustering. And so in this particular case, we talked about clustering in terms of survey weights and sampling and National Survey of Children with Special Health Care Needs that sampled kids by states and kids were clustered within states. So the idea being that kids in Massachusetts are more alike than, so two kids in Massachusetts are more alike than a child from Massachusetts and a child from Mississippi, right? For a number of reasons, measured, you know, sociopolitical, access to services, blah, blah, blah. So that clustering is really important to take into consideration because you need to, um, if you ignore it, it gives you, unbiased, it gives you biased results. And so outside of the realm of complex survey design, when you have a, a, a study design that involves sampling kids from multiple hospitals, multiple clinics, multiple schools, and so forth, kids are clustered within that school or that clinic, so you need to take into that, that clustering into account into your analyses. Here we had such a small amount of clustering because it was only three NICUs and 120 kids. The other study that I mentioned was 16 NICUs and we had almost 700 kids. So we really needed to take into account the clustering of kids within NICUs because practices are different across NICUs. So two babies in the, you know, NICU in Milwaukee are more alike than, you know, a baby in Milwaukee and a baby in, you know, somewhere in rural Wisconsin, for example. So I just wanted to to mention that, thank you for staying a couple extra minutes, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And next week is our last session, funding and publishing. Yes? Yeah, so, so the question was about software, statistical software for multiple imputation and complex surveys. So, I mean, the most co one of the most common um, statistical programs is SAS, and it's pretty easy to learn. Um, so you can do, mul so this multiple imputation I did in SAS. SAS is, you know, you can do some complex, you can do linear and logistic regressions. Um, you can do weighted frequencies, you know, so basically what I did here, you could have done, it, assuming this was a complex survey design, I could have done all of this in SAS. When you get a little bit more complex, you know, into complex models, um, or if you want to have a little, a, a program that handles um, survey weights a, a little better, Stata is, is one that most people use, because you can really, you can carve out what are called subpopulations and and so forth, um, because the problem is, so let's say, just as an example, you're interested in the National Survey of Children with Special Health Care Needs, but you, like me, are only interested in the birth to three population. So you cannot, you need to examine, you need to, all your analyses need to be on the entire survey sample. You cannot say, you know, if age greater than three, delete, because that is, that is very bad. 
that because your weights and your standard errors are based on the entire sample. So, you, so, it, so it's a little trickier to kind of carve out that little birth to three group in SAS. It's not impossible, um, but it's very e easy in Stata. It's one command, subpop, you know, age greater than three or age less than three. And then it looks at everybody. So people tend to, people who do a lot of complex survey designs tend to prefer Stata. Um, you know, it's, I, I think they're pretty, both pretty easy to learn. You know, it depends on who, what you want is for people around you, you want to have support. So if you're in with a group of SAS users, I would say probably stick with SAS. If, if nobody's using anything, I, you could pick one and get, get support either from us at CORE or the CCTSI. Um, Stata has a lot of online, well, both of them have a lot of online documentation and help, SAS support, help support is, is, is great, um, as is Stata. So, yeah, I would see it, say either SAS or Stata. I, a lot of people use SPSS. I have never, I've never used it, so I'm not sure what you can, I don't think you can do too much with complex survey designs in it, but I could be wrong about that because I've never used it. Do you know if MATLAB has that kind of analysis? If what is it? Yeah. I don't know what that it's a, is. It's a programming site, so I don't know. I don't know if it. I'd have to look into that. Yeah, is it kind of like R? Is that? Um, it's like C plus plus. Oh, okay. So similar to R. So those kinds of things are probably fine. You, it's not going to be as user friendly. Okay. You know, it might not have a Windows. Uh, you know, a Windows application and the code. My experience with those kinds of things is that, you know, the code is not as sort of user friendly. Oh, yeah, yeah, you have to write your own code for everything. And so if you like that kind of thing, if you're a computer science person and you like writing code and that, I mean, it's great because, because you really know what's going on under the hood. I mean, you have to understand your models. You can't just throw a bunch of variables in there and kind of, you know, not know what's happening. You really have to know your stuff for those kinds of things. So. Most people don't use those. They, you know, it's easier to use SAS and Stata, okay. yeah, or programs like that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.